Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, the world's most exciting podcast, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, New York Times best-selling author and National Radio Hall of Fame inductee, Michael Savage. Welcome to the free version of the Michael Savage podcast, and I'm going to keep it free for all of you. But there are many of you who would love to be able to listen to my show without any ads. I love ads, but many of you want to listen to the podcast free of ads. So we created something for you, a solution. We call it the Savage Premium. For less than the price of one flat, tasteless beer at your local bar, you can receive access to all of my podcasts going back years ad-free for just $3.99. That's at $3.99 a month. You'll get not only my ad-free podcast, but you will also occasionally receive access to material that is exclusive for members only, and I'm going to give you the list in a minute of what you've missed. You're going to get an occasional monologue from me, maybe a reading from one of my novels, sneak peeks of interviews before anyone else hears them, archive pieces dating back to 1994. Many things that come up, you're going to get exclusive access to Michael Savage material. Details can be seen on my website, michaelsavage.com, and if you want to join... All you got to do is go to glow.fm and search Savage Premium. That's glow.fm and search Savage Premium. Now, you will always have access to my free weekly podcast. I want to be clear about that. That's my promise to you. But if you want less ads and more Savage, join the Savage Premium Club today and never miss a spoken word of mine. It's glow.fm slash Savage Premium. You can find it on michaelsavage.com. And here's some of the stuff that you have missed so far. Michael Savage reading from his best-selling novel, Countdown to Mecca. My words, my voice. Savage reads from one of his lost journals, Fiji, 1968. Savage's first drive-time show, Hour One. My interview with the Jewish gangster, very popular. I uh, read from my first written, published article, Who Is at the Helm, from 1965. It's heard nowhere but on my premium site. I read passages from my novel, Abuse of Power. Uh, we replayed Fat Al's Tuna. My Savage show from 324.94, the earliest show in the archive, 324.94. My interview with Donald Trump from 110.2011. 110.2011, while Mark Levin was mocking him and Sean Hannity was mocking him uh, and the others were mocking him, I was interviewing Trump. Much more. And remember, subscribers also get ad-free podcasts every week. The cost is less than a beer at a bar, and you get a better buzz with, with the Savage Premium. So go to, go to glow.fm slash Savage Premium for full access to ad-free podcasts and exclusive sound you'll not hear anywhere else. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Michael Savage Podcast. I want to go back with you in time to 2014 when I was interviewed by Frank Malerba, a gentleman who runs crypticrock.com. And he interviewed me about how I became a fan of heavy metal music, if you can believe it, my love for rock and roll, and certain television shows. He, in other words, he asked me all about my love for music. Well, after eight years, we decided it was time to talk again about music, movies, television, things like that. Sit back, I think you're gonna enjoy this interview. We're speaking with Frank Malerba, correct? Correct, yes. Of Cryptic Rock. Frank, could you tell my audience what your magazine or publication is? Okay. So Cryptic Rock is an entertainment-based magazine, digital magazine, where we uh, do interviews with uh, you know, uh, actors, actresses, directors, musicians, uh, producers, and also Michael Savage. <laughs> and uh, we've been... Now, you interviewed me how many years ago, Frank? We spoke back in 2014, and we did a, a phone interview. And that was... Uh, we talked about music. We talked about Rock and Roll Friday, because at the time, you were still oh my God. doing Rock and Roll Friday. Frank, before we begin, you look like you are... Are you from the East Coast? I am. I'm originally from New York. I'm located in Connecticut now. Oh, well, you're going to have trouble getting heating oil, I see. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're rationing heating oil. But the, Frank, don't worry, though, because the windmills 
will save you. The windmills are going to heat your house this winter. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's like you said, we're going to have to start burning our mahogany furniture. <laughs> my old joke. <laughs> All the German leftists are going to burn their grandmother's mahogany furniture. They're going to have to get it out of a warehouse. Uh, but they can always blame Putin. So, Steve, tell me where to begin. You lead this dance and I will follow. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm not sure if they showed you. I had some questions for you. You know, obviously, we're going to do a natural conversation. But, um, you know, we were going to focus the interview based on uh, music and film, because I know that you're a big music and a film fan. Can I read you a little tweet to start this off that I put up this last night? Yes. Is I, I rarely watch HBO. I, I mean, I, I originally signed up HBO for The Sopranos, okay? And since then, I haven't really seen much on HBO that I've liked, and I keep paying them. I don't know why. So I went, I stumbled around last night. I was bored, and I stumbled upon an HBO show called The White Lotus. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, HBO's The White Lotus is another seductive anti-white hit piece which attacks those of us who pay the bills. When will a brainwashed execs at HBO learn we will not all go happily to our deaths under the direction of suicidal, sophomoric, drug-addicted TV and ad agency leftists? Other than that, I had no reaction. <laughs> and they did suck me in. I, I'll tell you, it was very seductive. I mean, set in Hawaii, the characters are beautiful, very entertaining. And before you know it, you're being slapped about the head and neck with typical leftist drivel. <laughs> it's uh, very common nowadays. It seems like there's a, that's actually one of the things I wanted to talk to you about in one of the questions, how there's a agenda driven. Uh, I think that anyone, regardless of their political views, could see there is an agenda in everything being made these days. And it's exhausting. I mean, entertainment should be entertainment. Well, in Stalin's time, all art had to be political art. For example, we all know what Soviet art looked like. Uh, uh, again, I don't want to be extreme in it, but truthfully, in Hitler's time, every piece of art had to conform to the view of the Aryan, the super Aryan. Everything else was considered the great art, for example, that he called degenerate art is the art that I love. Uh, I'm thinking of Chagall. Didn't, didn't Hitler call Chagall's art degenerate art, for example? Yes. Yeah. Well, so now... <laughs> Now we're living in a time where everything, anything patriotic is, is considered degenerate fascist right wing art. It's crazy. It's crazy. Where is the art? I don't know. I feel like the art is dying in a lot of ways. It's uh, it's uh, it's tough. It's tough. Sometimes you feel like you can't even turn on the television without some sort of a agenda being thrown in your face. And it's just uh, it's exhausting. Well, you wait for it. So I find myself watching um argentinian or spanish movies from spain but they have to be pre-2018 because after 2018 when I, when I think the obamas entered netflix the board of directors everything changed in every netflix drama there is a character who looks like barack obama or michelle obama they worked into the into the show you, you talk about narcissism but it, it, but 2018 they were still producing great art well, one of the, you know, a very, very entertaining art, especially in Europe. But I don't, I don't know where to turn anymore. I, everything I, I turn on. So I'm watching documentaries. I'm, I, I watch Sopranos reruns like a lunatic because they're so remarkable. Each piece in the Sopranos is a, is a masterpiece. There's not a flawed line or a flawed shot in any one of the segments. And there was certainly no political correctness or wokeness or whatever you want to call it today but please i think you wanted to go back to the early uh influences you say let's go right to, I mean, what what turned you on to music when you were younger is that a good place to begin yes exactly i'm curious because you are someone who has um a great deal of interest in all types of music and you're uh you're very open-minded with music so i'm curious where did it all start for you what turned you on to music when you were younger right how can a so-called right-wing uh ultra right-wing maniac like me like black jazz cuban music <laughs> rock and roll classical music how can it be it's because maybe i'm not what they say i am so let's begin i, I made notes when i saw we were going to interview i was looking forward to this today i, I i'm working too hard but I said, this will be the great, the great relief I need today. So I said, what was the first music I heard as a child that I really resonated with? And it was Gene Autry. 
and he was singing i'm back until i'm back in the saddle again and i i became obsessed with it i must have i must have had ocd because they got me i swear to god i'm an old guy they got me a hand cranked victrola i don't mean 1890s but i'm talking the late 1940s frank i'd wind it up and i put on a 78 which i think are popular now you they're very big collectibles and it was gene archery here's this kid living in a tenement in the bronx and i'm listening to this western voice till i'm back in the saddle again back where a friend is a friend so it brought to my mind a world i didn't even know existed a world of the west where there were friends where the wildlife played wide open spaces it seemed so magical to me that such a place could exist and music took me there it took me out of the sad little world of uh, the bronx that i was living in and that's when I, I i you could say that's when i found the magic of music wow it, it, you know and i imagine uh it's it sprung from there i mean obviously you discovered rock and roll as you went along you know as that became more mainstream so you know let's talk about that you, like you just said you're not what people think you are at least the people who know you they know that that's not true they know to know me is to love me frank that's a <laughs> rock and roll song <laughs> michael savage a host like no other hey savage listeners i want to tell you about kachava my team's daily super blend if you're like me trying to stay on top of your health and get all your nutrients then please listen because kachava has you covered Kachava puts everything your body needs in one glass. All the superfoods, all the protein, all the greens, all the vitamins, all the omegas, all the benefits for your brain, your gut, your skin, your muscles, your heart, your whole health. No more compromise, no more guilt. No other nutritional shake does all this. They travel to the ends of the earth to source all the most powerful superfoods, and they crush them up. It's so simple. You take two scoops of powder, you add water, you blend it up, and you enjoy it. You're going to be surprised how good it actually tastes. My team drinks cachava for breakfast, and they tell me they have energy all day long and they feel great. You've got to go try cachava for yourself. Right now, they've got a special offer for my listeners. Go to cachava.com slash savage. That's K-A-C-H-A-V-A, cachava, K-A-C-H-A-V-A dot com slash savage. You're going to get 10% off your first order. That's K-A-C-H-A-V-A dot com slash savage. Well, you know, you're a very compelling individual in many aspects because you defy any stereotypes that one would have of you. And anyone who's paid attention to the years would understand that. And people who just, you know, hear sound clips or just hear what they're told are foolish. Anyway. Um, well, no, that's an important point because who really is what they say they are in the stereotypical rendition? We're all individuals. And if you give a person a chance to emerge from what you think they are, you may find something worth listening to. Right. And no, no one should be one dimensional, although it seems like a lot of people are one dimensional nowadays. But uh, um, yeah, like I, I am a progressive. I glue myself to the walls of museums. I throw mashed potatoes on a Monet because I'm a great person. <laughs> Well, that's, you know, today's world, it seems a very strange, strange world. But, but why attack a Monet with mashed potatoes, the latest offense against Western civilization? Well, I would say that they then glue themselves to the walls. I would leave them glued there for three days. Did you see the ones who did it two weeks ago in Paris? They started complaining that they wanted a pot to defecate and urinate in and they wouldn't get the pots. I would leave them glued for a week. <laughs> That's great. So this is obviously a, a phenomenon. It's not just affecting America, the, the craziness. It's it's a it's a pandemic throughout the entire uh, uh, world. <laughs> good line. It is a pandemic. And it's by the way, it's vicious fascism to do this to Western civilization. These are iconic paintings that symbolize the greatest art that Western civilization has yet produced. So you're going to who did this before? Well, ISIS did it. When ISIS took over swaths of Iraq, what did they do? They knocked over statues from the 1100s because they were considered, in, what did they call them? Uh, infant, I don't know. They were not 
politically correct to the Islamic fanatics. So how different are these fanatics to the Islamic fanatics? They're the same mentality. Knock over statues, destroy art that you don't like, and then eventually kill the people you don't like. Right. Yeah, well, you know, um, fanatical behavior, uh, you know, it it's the same all across the board, I think, no matter what it is, you know, it, it, there needs to be balance, and it doesn't seem like there's any balance nowadays. It's uh, completely off balance. So, you know, you know, years ago, you're bringing up a subject that's interesting. I remember back in the um, in the 90s when I started in radio, there was a big outcry about a piece of, quote, art that was installed in the Brooklyn Museum. It was about a crucifix that had been immersed in urine. And they considered that the idiots who ran the museum, the board of directors, included that in the collection. But I didn't see any fanatical Catholics go there. And glue themselves to the wall and knock over the crucifix in urine. They just objected to it in a very strong manner. So it's a big difference between uh, objecting or protesting and becoming violently destructive. And unfortunately, the left has a sense of righteousness right now that's extremely dangerous. But I'd rather talk about the music. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, let, let's go back to Gene Autry. The next one was Roy Rogers. Loved cowboy movies. I'm a little kid now listening to this stuff. And I'm living in the Bronx and I never see a horse. And I see these handsome guys riding horses with beautiful wives wearing fringes. My mother didn't have fringe outfits in, 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 in the Bronx. She didn't have any pants with fringes on them. I thought they were so, so attractive. You know, girls with fringes on their legs. Man, did I want to meet one of those girls. Took me, took me quite a while to meet them in the hippie days, but eventually I did. <laughs> Well, that's where it all started for you. But, you know, like I said, you uh, became a lover of jazz and rock and roll and Cuban music and later on even heavy metal. So what what yeah. broadened you, you know, because it takes a particular type, a type of person to like all types of music. Not everyone's like that. People stick with one form of music. What broadened your horizons? Uh, that's very interesting. Do they stick with one kind of music? It's a great question. You know, it's a, you're bringing up so many questions about music. So I made notes for the conversation today. So we jump from childhood, the Gene Autry cowboy music, to teen years. Now I'm in high school, in junior high school, rather. I'm in junior high school. Uh, peg pants, sa saddle stitch, peg pants, trying to look like a little Elvis with all the other kids. And um, the lyrics were all about love and yearning for love boys and girls it was about love and yearning for love girls were on a pedestal nobody would would have even made a, a piece of music putting down a woman or degrading a woman or a mother and i thought more about that and i said frank wait a minute not only were lyrics about love and marriage and yearning for love but it was about falling in love getting married and having a family Love and marriage, love and marriage, go together like a horse and carriage. Now, compare that to the lyrics of today. I can't even come up with a comparable anti-love and marriage song, but I'm sure you could. <laughs> and and then then in your, I'm in high school. It's a junior year, and I can't wait to graduate and get the hell out of there. I hated school. And I'm thinking, what song got me through junior the junior year? A white sport coat and a pink carnation. And I imagined myself suddenly becoming all american i'm going to get a white sport coat and a pink carnation i'm going to be an american boy remember i'm an immigrant son frank part of my life is in the old world part of my life's in the new world i'm trying to become an american so i figured that's how you become an american you get a white sport coat and a pink carnation but you know i was thinking about that as well frank this is not funny but it, it, it's kind of tragically funny so my dad worked seven days a week in his little store in new york in the lower east side and then he started taking me to work to teach me to be a good American worker, meaning you'll learn how to make some money. You'll learn the value of a dollar. You're not going to hang around and be a bum on a Saturday after school. You're going to work with me. So we drive into DeSoto when we're living in Queens in a little attached house. Imagine the car, you know, a car called a DeSoto. No one even knows what it was. It, it's quite politically correct these days to have a DeSoto. They should bring it out again. The Conquistador would be a big car, but big car it was green with a roof rack so you can carry goods on it and deliver things and we're driving from queens to the store on these horrible i hated going there 
There was nothing good about it. It was horrible. I wanted to hang around with my friends and be a, just a wastrel and do nothing. Listen to music, maybe smoke some marijuana later on when we got to be teenagers. But I couldn't. So we drive over the bridge, and I'm grim in this car. You think of a black and white movie from Poland, like in 1948. That's the image. It's like a bad Polish movie, not even Polanski. It's pre-Polanski, black and white, horrible realism. And it's cold in the car. He wouldn't even put the heater on because he wanted me to be tough. You know, heat. You don't need heat. It's not good for your health. I'm shivering in the car. What do you mean? No heat. I'm wearing an overcoat. You see your breath in the car. No heat. No, he was old school. So I would try to turn the radio on to break the grimness. There was no conversation either. Not even like, hey, son, how are you? The word son was never used in that car. I turned the radio on. He says, no music. No music. I, I didn't even understand. What do you mean no music? You're going to work. In other words, this is grimness. Get ready for grimness. This was like pre-Putin, man. I was like living with Putin in the DeSoto. You know, go on the battlefield and get ready to die for the nation. So this is the kind of grimness. He didn't like music. So now we're going to jump cut. Frank, you got me entertaining you now. I love this. So it's years later. I'm in high school or college. And this is like a music-free household. You're not allowed music in, in this Polish realism even though we were from poland i think the family was originally from belarus uh not poland but it's like the image of eastern europe think eastern europe before the wall came down where there was no joy no dungarees nothing people just walked around with misery on their faces years later now i fall in love with jazz my mother was wonderful and she was i guess more oriented towards the children and art she went and bought what was called a hi-fi in those days. It was a blonde cabinet that played 33 and a half uh, discs, right? Which are, I think they're very popular. These They're collector's items, right? Yeah. So she brings it home and says, Shh, don't tell dad, you know. It's like secretly gets it in the house, the delivery man. And we're all afraid when he's going to come home from work, comes home grim. I don't want to turn him into a monster. He just worked hard and he was very unhappy. He comes in, and I'm playing, I think, Cannibal Adderley. So he, I had fallen in love with Cannibal Adderley. I loved him. I just went crazy for him. We're standing around, my sister and I, my mother, listening to jazz music. In comes Putin, my dad. And he hears music in the house. That's number one. The first giveaway, something horrible is going to happen. And he comes in, poor guy's face is fucking white from exhaustion from the cold from the drive into the soto from the business not going well and he says what's that meaning looking at it like what's this thing in the house that you brought in get it out of here and my mother stands up we are not it crosses over no we're not getting it out of here the kids like the music what's that junky music he's playing what's that junky music meaning you know cannibal adley junky music well, he was right. It probably was junky music, but I love junky music. In fact, I fell in love with junky music because of that. And that brings me to the next phase of my, of my music life. And I brought out this little set for you to see because this sort of defines it all. The Blue Note Collector's Edition. You probably have seen this over the years, right? Yes. And you actually mentioned that to me back in 2014. You mentioned that's what you listened to prior to getting ready for a show at the time. You Unbelievable. Said I saved this. My friend Danny Horowitz, my lawyer, a Jewish guy from New York, great guy, lives out here so many years. He opened me up. He knows that I love the music. Look at it. Cannibal Adderley, Art Blakey. Oh, my God. Kenny Burrell, Donald Byrd, Paul Chambers, John Coltrane, of course. Herbie Hancock. I'm reading some of the names people may be familiar with to these days. Hank Mobley, Thelonious Monk, one of the greats, Bud Powell, Sonny Rollins, Wayne Shorter, Horace Silver, and Jimmy Smith. I love Horace Silver's song for my father. And uh, I, I cherish this this edition, and I, you know, I, I do listen to it, honestly. But, you know, you think about it from the age of you having to take a record. First, you could have no records. You had to listen to the radio to get music, okay, in America. Okay, whatever they played, you heard. They selected it for you. Then you could buy uh, a stereo. Okay. Then you could buy, well, actually, we had the Victrola for single records. Then you can get a stereo. Then you had the Sonny, Sonny Walkman, which must have been a like going to the moon for people to listen to their own music. Or walk. You'd see them in the streets in New York with the, the Walkman plugged into their ears. They were in another world. They were in their own world, the music, the world of music, whatever they wanted, right? Now, imagine I'm living in a time 
which to me is a guy born in 1942 that I could turn my iPhone on and I could go to music on Apple. So here's my current favorite. It's been very warm out here in Northern California recently. And I have a Corvette that's only a year old, the new C8. And um, before that, I wasn't a Corvette guy. And I, I play this on the eight speakers, driving with the top down, making as much noise as I can at my age, like a, a teenager. And no one knows what the hell I'm doing. And I'm playing this. Well, here's a whole collection that I've been playing, but the one I've been going crazy for, it's El Faisan by Johnny Pacheco. I moved to another, another place. First of all, I imagine singing on a stage with them. And I lament that I didn't become a singer. I'm a, 26 years in talk radio. My, my voice is my instrument. I know that. And people said, you have a musical voice, blah, blah, blah. But still in all, I imagine myself, I wish I had taken up singing and somehow even as a hobby gotten into singing on the weekends with a Latin band, just being up there in a little costume with them and moving on the stage, dancing on two. So a lot of that music is, it's Afro-Cuban music, I think it's called. They call it salsa music, I guess, in the genre. You would know better than I. But it, it, Latin jazz, you can call it anything you want. But uh, that music changed my life in so many different ways. And the lyrics, though, were idiotic. So I translated this because I said, what am I listening to here? El Faisan, da, 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 da. And I don't know what El Faisan is. So I go, <laughs> I go on Google. It's about a peacock. And it says, don't mess with the peacock, basically. <laughs> don't, don't mess with the peacock. And I start to laugh. And I understood it was a double. It was a joke. Now, either what they meant was literally a peacock can be very dangerous if you incite it. It could, like, peck you to death with its beak, right? It's not a... It's not like a weak animal, but I don't think that's what it meant. I think Johnny Pacheco was like a peacock. And if I and I could be wrong, I think he was gay. I'm not sure. I love him to death. Whatever he was. Don't know. Don't care. Great musician. I think what he was saying is don't fuck with the peacock because I can beat you anyway. Even if I'm gay, I'll knock your teeth out. I'm not sure. That's even if it's not what he meant. It's what I got out of it. Meaning don't fuck with the peacock, whether he means it literally or figuratively. I got the joke, and I think it has a double meaning in the Latin uh, tradition because they're very obsessed with the, the maricone. The Latin musicians were always obsessed with the gay, the maricone, you know, is how they looked at it. So anyway, I got so much out of this music on so many different levels, and now when I'm reading the lyrics, I'm getting a kick out of it in those, way, in, in those ways as well. So we've gone from we've gone from the blue note collection of jazz. We went to Cuban music. We touched on rock and roll. We haven't done anything else. But before we move on, if I may, I went back to the teenage years. All the males had wonderful voices. Dean Martin, Al Martino, Frank Sinatra, Bobby Darin. And then we go to the African-American musicians, Fats Domino, Frankie Lyman and others. Every one of them spoke to me. Every one of them got me through bad times. Like they got me through algebra. Another one got me through geometry. <laughs> Another one got me through trigonometry. Another one got me through a horrible January in New York. A grimness, like there's no future. Just walking through slush, getting off the Q44A, going to school or whatever. You know, it was a horrible, dark reality. You know what New York's like in the winter. And the oh, yeah. music lifts you up carries you through it so music has always been for me a medica a medicine music is, is is medication i think it is for a lot of people for sure i mean uh it would be pretty dark and dull without music uh you know it's uh it's how we speak to one another universally the savage nation it's savage on demand let me ask you something. Will the lack of a red wave during the midterms lead to a more emboldened Biden? Are we going to have more wasteful government spending, higher taxes, deepening inflation? And how are you going to protect your hard-earned savings from chaotic financial markets? There's only one answer. By diversifying your retirement savings with real, physical, precious metals with Birch Gold Group. They're the only gold group I trust. I want you to text SAVAGE. To 989-898. Text SAVAGE to 989-898 for a free info kit on protecting your savings with gold in a tax-sheltered account. 
Birch Cold has almost 20 years experience converting IRAs and 401ks into precious metals IRAs. Text SAVAGE to 989-898 and claim your free no-obligation info kit now. Please don't let the left devalue your savings. Own physical gold and silver in a tax-sheltered retirement account from Birch Gold, the only gold company I trust. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers. So please, text SAVAGE to 989-898 and secure your future with gold. Do it today. Text SAVAGE to 989-898 right now. Text SAVAGE to 989-898 now. And you know, um, you spoke to me about how your son, Russ, inadvertently turned you on to heavy metal because <laughs> he had the tape in his drawer and you're like, what the hell is this crap? I want to want it in my house, whatever. And you, you up- <laughs> I became my father, in other words, right? Now you're <laughs> reminding me. That, that happened, but you, you ended up listening to it and you saw what he got out of it. You, you actually started to appreciate it, right? Well, it's an interesting story. So he had been listening to it, I guess, in high school. Then he went away to college, and you know the empty nest syndrome. If you ever become a father or your father, when your kid leaves for college, you your heart goes, it's it's over. It's like your life is over because your child has gone with him. So he leaves, and I'm going through the shit he left behind, you know, so and, he, and there's music, there's heavy metal stuff, Metallica. I never heard of them, and I start to play it, and I fell in love with them. I thought it was some of the most amazingly powerful music I ever heard in my life. <laughs> it was after he left it was like to hold on to my son in a way while he was away at college right so that was the way i i, I got into that so uh you know and on my radio show it was heavy metal was the signature opening right. other than blue monday and rock and roll friday to this day as a podcaster i could, i still get people saying we loved heavy metal we loved heavy metal we loved heavy metal i think that drew more people in than i would imagine I think that you had um, a clip of Master of Puppets, Metallica. Um, you had um, a song by Motley Crue, I think, a clip of as well. Um, oh, yeah, Motley Crue, yeah. great. But it's it's very compelling to hear about all this, how you got, you were interested in that. Also, another, I think another band that you'd appreciate it was Rammstein, Rammstein. Oh, I love yeah. Rammstein. Du hast. Yes. Du hast. Du hast nicht. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love Rammstein. It had such a powerful feel to it. Yeah. You know, but I also did it to play with my audience because, of course, they were, they were great musicians. I don't even know if they're still around. But when I would play it, it was to drive the liberals crazy because they would immediately think that because I was playing German heavy metal, it was like Nazi music because they're so they're so biased and prejudiced. Anything in German is Nazi to them. Right. It's like anything who's a cons- any conservative or patriot in America is a Nazi. The same with German music. Du hast, du hast, du hast nicht. So right away, oh, you're playing Nazi music. What are you doing? I was doing the f- with your head. That's what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it fit well. And, you know, and uh, it, it just shows your diversity, you know. So this- well, because I've had a lot of adversity. I know about diversity. Exactly. Well, you know. Adversity is uh, is good in life and to a point. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, not to get off the arts, but I think we all need a little adversity. It makes us stronger. It makes us who we are. We missed Jimi Hendrix, one of the greats. Absolutely. I'm trying to find some of the jewel cases, Jimmy. Now, here's something that I always loved. I like military music. This is one of the great pieces, Victory at Sea. One of the great pieces. I need to say, what the hell is that? Again, music. Uh, it was by Rogers. I, who are these? Who, who are the great composer of this? Victory at Sea, the Song of the High Seas, Guadalcanal March, blah, blah, blah. This piece of music of Victory at Sea, to this day, if I hear it, I, I'm stirred in another way, in a patriotic manner. It gives me strength. Um, military music can do that if it's done well. And it's a little side note. In the 1980s, I was given an award. No one even knows about this, Frank. It was called the Japan Creativity Society Award. No one even ever heard of it. There really is a Japan Creativity Society. 
So this Japanese fellow, he must have weighed 90 pounds, like the Bataan Death March type, wiry as hell, comes to America and gives me this award. I became his friend. I went to Japan years later with my son. It's a whole separate story. I, I forgot all these stories. And um, he told me that every morning he wakes up in Japan and he listens to military, very militant military mm-hmm. music. The minute he gets out of bed, I said, Yukio, why do you do that? He says, gives me strength. It's like, gives me strength. He programs his brain into this, you know, militant military thing. I couldn't believe it. So I think that's missing in our society as well. By the way, this kind of you say, well, what's missing military music? I don't know. Maybe. Why do people like bands like in parades? Rather, they, they get something out of that strength. I don't know. They must like it for some reason. So that love that music. Now, here's something really oddball. I bet no one ever heard of this guy. Does this look familiar? No, to you? it does not. But I'm not familiar with that. OK, this will bring tears to my eyes if I listen to it, which I'm not going to do because I tend to get sentimental. This is is IZ in concert. The man is music, a blind Hawaiian musician who will play the most plaintive guitar and singing you could ever hear on this planet. And you listen to this music you cannot believe it uh again i can't give words to is the man in his music it's from 1998 he's since died by the way <clears throat> the guy weighed you know 300 pounds he had diabetes or any other conditions but what a heart and soul this guy had you know so i could listen to island music because people forget i lived in the islands for years and i know fijian music which i don't want to bring in to this either but, you know, a lot of the South Pacific music, again, phenomenally powerful and influential in how it would move me. And it's, you know, what I discovered about music is that especially when you get into the more rarefied folk musics, they are created in a certain geography in a certain place. And the music actually is drawn from the sounds of that place. So if you're actually in the South Pacific and you're near an ocean, you could actually feel the mo- motion of the ocean, motion of the ocean in the music. They, they picked it up out of literally out of the air. That's where they got their music from was from the wind. Music is wind at the end of the day. Moving, moving thing. Right? Isn't music all wind? It is. Whether it's a wind instrument or a string instrument, it's moving right. air. Right. Music is energy. It's, uh, it, it's, it's energy in that aspect. Absolutely. So, you, you know, you've shown just in the few minutes here, your broad taste in music and your, you know, eclectic taste there. So what about film? I mean, because you mentioned, obviously, Sopranos in more modern times is something that really interests you. Obviously, a phenomenal series. I don't think anything has really touched it since. Um, But what is something else besides the Sopranos films or series that came before or thereafter that has really stuck with you? You know, I almost would have to spend another half a day thinking about it but before we leave i pulled something else that i have to mention about music you can include it or not which is opera italian opera i've also gone to german opera which is also fabulous but i love italian opera and i have printed out the lyrics of some of my favorites which i've found in the laying around by the music thing la donne mobile from rigoletto for example and i would print this so i could sing along with the great uh singers right Another one is Vesti La Giuba lyric. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, sorry, I don't know Italian that well. But in Vesti La Giuba, this one, fantastic opera. Again, very moving. And the stories are simplistic. They're usually about love and loss, like all popular tunes. It's always about love and loss. And um, so you got the opera, but you wanted to know about film. Wow, that's a whole story. Let me just begin in a free association, if I can, Frank, would that work? Because I have no notes on this. The first movie I ever remember in in my memory bank that I ever saw where I was moved by it was, because I looked it up years later, she wore a yellow ribbon. I don't even know. I fell in love with the girl lead. I don't know who it was. She wore a yellow ribbon. I was six years old. And all I know is there was this beautiful woman with blonde hair on a wagon, whipping horses and racing away from something. And all I know is I couldn't sleep that night. I remembered this memory, that woman's visage, the persona of that woman. 
with a yellow ribbon, that strong woman, you know, making the horses run, not afraid of horses, not she Into wore this a yellow danger ribbon. infested land comes one woman, young, provocative. Because of her, men fight heroically. Because of her, men die. I know all this is because of me. Only the man who commands can be blamed. It rests on me. Don't pull rank on me, you've been green-eyed ever since she put on that yellow ribbon. Button up that Watch shirt, mister. Yes, please. You can sneer all you want to, but you keep your paws off my girl. That was the first movie I remember. There was a movie called, I actually watched it on TV a week ago. They're rerunning it again. I don't even know why. And I don't even think the woman lead in it is very good looking anymore. But as a, as a boy, I fell in love with her. So, okay, movie. Then what? Movies. Who the hell remembers? I, I don't know. You're talking a long time ago. Images. Frank, you got to remember, I was born before television. I know it sounds like I'm the uh, rhyme of the ancient mariner here. There, which is interesting in a way. It's actually probably going to be interesting for some of your readers. Here's a guy who grew up before uh, television. I did. You think about it. The, the early 40s, there was no TV. It was all radio. I grew up in an audio world. My father would listen to the Green Hornet. I'd lie in his lap. He'd smoke the Philip Morris. I'd inhale a secondhand smoke. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And I would eat like the Green Hornet. And he sees, and you hear the sound of the fog going. And my father explained to me that he liked radio better than movies. I said, why? He said, because it forces you to imagine the story. Mm -hmm. He taught me to use my imagination. It's very interesting. And that's why I was naturally good in radio, because I grew up in radio. I'm one of the few people left who actually grew up listening to radio. It wasn't late for me. It was early. Okay, so movies. So you go from radio, movies, she wore a yellow ribbon. The Green Hornet. I don't remember many movies. I don't think I went to a lot of movies until the 50s when they were already kind of technicolor, you know, kind of dopey movies at that point. I don't remember going to the movies as a kid in the 40s at all. I remember the first TV set that came into into the Bronx was a neighbor in one of the tenement apartments got a television set and there were like 25 kids in the room watching this little screen on which they put a magnifying glass to make it bigger. I don't know if you ever saw any of these things. Nothing. And all the kids would sit around and watch the Howdy Doody show. The, but there were no, I don't remember any movies. If there's any movies, it was Hop Along Cassidy. That's about it. Movie. I had no, no knowledge of film. My parents were not intellectuals, as some had intellectual parents. Uh, you know, Coppola's father was, after all, a concert musician who played at Radio City Music, Music Hall, I think. He grew up in the world of art and music. I didn't. I did not come from a so-called cultured background. So to me, I didn't understand it, really. I had to learn everything on my own, meaning what I liked, and then investigate why I liked it. Honest to God, I can't tell you what I liked until the 50s come along. And then there's a slew of the greatest movies you could ever remember, you know, whether it was James Dean. Let's start with Marlon Brando. Who didn't love Marlon Brando on the waterfront or the wild ones? Who did not want to be Marlon Brando? Everyone I knew wanted to be Marlon Brando. This guy changed everything. He played the hero, the sullen hero, though. The, the sullen hero, the sullen hero, not the happy hero, not the John Wayne two-fisted hero. He played the sullen hero. Then along comes James Dean. James Dean is a total different story. The outcast, the kind of pissed off kid, everything bothers him. The world sucks. He doesn't like anything. He's an anarchist, really. James Dean, right? Remember that movie? What was that movie? Um, Rebel no, Without a Cause. Drunken brawls those parties turn into. It's no place for kids. A minute ago, you said you didn't care if he drinks. He said a little drink. You're tearing me apart! What? You you say one thing, he says another, and everybody changes back again! <laughs> oh, my God. Did that strike a chord with me? And Sal Minio? awesome character people don't even know how great salminio really was in creating a, a pathos for that type of personality so i i love that i love the, the, the that genre and then of course there were the macho men movies that at the time i didn't really care for the uh broderick crawford you know he was on tv with the highway patrol jumping out of the highway patrol cars leaving the door open the heavy set loved them they, you know later on they made a character like broderick crawford in the, um, a, a thing called tannin another tv series 
I like Sterling Hayden enormously. I didn't know how much I, I did not know how much I appreciated him until the Godfather came along. He played the big Irish cop who busts Michael Corleone's face open with one punch when he says, hold him up, hold the punk up. And you feel that big Irish fist of this six foot six guy coming at this little Italian face as the other cops are holding his hands and saying, there's a captain. He's a war hero. Hold him up. I've, I've frisked a hundred punks like him and he busts him in the face and he smashes his nose and face open because he stood up to him. So that was Sterling Hayden, that great voice. Now, I look back on his other movies. They were awesome. But I then read his biography, Frank. Sterling Hayden hated Hollywood. Sterling Hayden put down every movie he was ever in. He said they were garbage. They weren't even worth all the money they paid him. He spent it as fast as he got it because he so detested everyone in Hollywood. But his character was awesome. It turns out he had lived not far from where I live here and went to a barber shop that I recently went. His picture still on the wall. And I had walked past this barber shop for years and saw his picture in there. I heard Sterling Hayden had his haircut. So I went in there about three months ago after COVID. I hadn't had my hair cut in two years. I did, you know, jailhouse haircuts with a mirror my, myself. And I go in there and I say to the guy, if you can cut Sterling Hayden's hair, you can cut mine. He was an old Italian barber, 84. He said, I actually never met him. But I give you a haircut. The guy gave me the worst haircut I ever had in my life. It may as well have been in Sing Sing. I, I didn't want to say anything. It's taken me till now to get my hair trained back to where it won't sit. It won't sit on my head. It's like a Sing Sing haircut. What he gave me, but I enjoy the experience. So, so certainly Hayden got his haircut down in Sausalito in his barber shop. But the Savage Nation. It's savage, uncut, unfiltered, and raw. The Air Traffic Out of Control podcast has landed. Each week you can hear crazy, funny, and downright nerve-wracking audio from airport control towers around the globe. Well, we're outside here. They're saying the ramp is closed. They won't let us park because of the uh, Air Force One. It's tower 192. There apparently is a passenger opened up an overwing exit and is now on the wing attempting to jump. Can you alert uh, police, please? Real audio from pilots and air traffic controllers. You absolutely need to maintain radio silence if it's not ATC related. You know, obstructions here at traffic control. Otherwise, we can file some paperwork. Air Traffic Out of Control is now available wherever you get your podcasts. Don't miss it. Anyway, so I like Sterling Hayden, Roderick Crawford, all of these macho dudes, great characters. And I, I tend to like to watch their movies today because it reminds me of a time in America where the hero always won and the bad always got punished in the end. And I think this is an important point that I tried to make a few weeks ago on, on Twitter and on one of my podcasts. All the plots in the 50s till the antihero came along was about, it was always, you know, uh, um, I have to look it up to get it exact. I don't want to paraphrase. You mind if I, I go backwards for a minute here? I got to no. find this and go past. I know two pieces of the three, but I can't remember the third part of it right now. I'm getting a little Biden moment here. <laughs> here it is. Hubris, nemesis, catharsis. Hubris, nemesis, catharsis. So what did I mean by that? It means in all these movies, there's, it starts out with a gangster who has filled with hubris. He's untouchable. No one could get him. Till he meets his nemesis, which would be Elliot Ness, for example. And then eventually the catharsis comes for the viewer the criminal is either killed or put in jail so it's a you know beginning middle and end hubris nemesis catharsis that's how movies were made in those days and we all like the catharsis that came no matter how arrogant and high he flew we knew the criminal in the end was going to get caught and punished or killed and we like that we like the moral play and now we've reached a point where the reverse is true it's every character since the 60s is an anti-hero. The cop is made to be the bad guy. And uh, the criminal is made to be someone who's misunderstood no matter what he does. He can rape a five-year-old, but you're supposed to understand them. This is the insanity of the time we're living in right now. So you get the picture. There was, in other words, a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the bad guy got punished. Now the bad guy wins. Right. Yeah, and that was actually something I wanted to ask you about. You know, um, it seems like we, we touched on it a little bit before, before we got into the questions, 
it seems like everything that's been produced over the past, I don't know, six, seven years, there's always an agenda to it. And it seems like a lot of things being made are extremely mm. dark and cold, not in a realism sense like you were talking about earlier, like, you know, black and white, but really dark, cold, <laughs> really, um, I don't know, deep, dark topics in, inside of our psyche. And hopeless, and hopelessness. Yes. It, they induce hopelessness, I think. Um, that's what implied, I'm trying to get right? at. And, you know, what do you think of the state of filmmaking? I mean, because what I said before, I think that sometimes you watch a film for a fantastical escape from reality. You don't always want to be banged over the head with this harshness. Well, also, there was a moral element to it. Let, let's go back to The Godfather, which was the beginning of a whole change in the in the crime series, crime of uh, film. So in the beginning, they lay the groundwork. Puzo was a great writer. I read all of his books, Mario Puzo. And they lay the groundwork and they show Don Corleone comes over as a poor Italian Sicilian immigrant. He takes a job in a grocery store. They barely have enough to eat him and his wife and his first child. And in one touching scene, he brings home one apple or a, a pair and the wife says how beautiful that pair is extremely touching and he's as honest as they can be he wouldn't steal a penny out of that grocery store right now here's a guy who becomes a crime boss the head of the five families they show you the turning point the guy who runs the, mo the, the mob in the in the italian neighborhood in the lower east side at that time the black hand goes to the grocery store owner and says i want you to hire my nephew and he says but i have a grocery boy he says fire him so the grocer fires this poor young Don Corleone and he gives him a basket of groceries to take home to his wife. So what is he going to do to feed his family? Slowly, he's pushed into crime in order to survive. Later on, he won't go into drugs. That's a big point in The Godfather. That's why he gets shot by the Turk, Salazzo, because he refuses to distribute drugs. The mafia wouldn't touch drugs at that time. So again, they're showing the morality of the gangster in that movie. Now the reverse is true. There's no morality at all. They'll kill their mother for a dime. For a nickel, they'll kill their own mother. So all morals are out the window. There's no substance to, <clears throat> let's say, there's no, no, no way to even look up to a tough guy anymore because they're all made of, 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 of absolutely garbage. There's no humanity that's worthy of um, respect. Let's put it to you that way. You don't want to respect the degenerate. So that's how the crime dramas have changed. I don't know uh, if there are any characters today in the crime field that have any redeeming value whatsoever. They're all shown to be killing children and families and dogs and killing the cat, burning the house down. So why watch that shit? It leaves you with the most horrible feeling. And it's hopelessness. Well, you look at some of the other homicidal movies that are being made, where you hope in the end they catch the guy who kidnapped the person who they're hiding in a basement, and the guy is tapping on the ceiling, and the cop comes to look for her or something, and you hope the cop's going to hear the person tapping the chair down below, and in the end she's going to be saved. And instead, no, the cop gets knocked over the head and thrown into another basement, and that's how the movie ends. And you go, you want to commit suicide after that. It's like. There's no, you don't know which way to turn. People are going to the movies for relief, as you just said, and they go home and they need they need drugs to get the relief. They can't even get it from a movie. It used to be entertainment. Entertainment. You're supposed to come away feeling better, not worse. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was the point I was trying to make there. You mentioned about characters um, that had redeeming quality. Tony Soprano. He he obviously he was a bad guy bad but you you did feel some uh some empathy for him at certain points in that series yes oh he was a complex character and of course the therapy sessions with dr melfi made him a human in other words you never saw a mafia guy it was it was absolutely unacceptable for anyone in the in that world to go to a therapist they were considered weak and dangerous because if they're telling a shrink all this shit they they could all get you know a, let's say the police or whatever the fbi could catch them because he's shooting he's talking he's a rat anyone who was that weak and have to talk to a therapist is a rat to them so now you see this mob guy hiding out and sneaking into a, a therapist's office who has fainting spells from what his mother did to him because she was really crazy 
<laughs> and they go back to the mother who drove him nuts. She was a great character, by the way. I hated oh, her. Yeah. Remember her? Remember the mother? Oh, she was fantastic. I love the shame that she passed. Otherwise, she would have lasted longer. On I loved her. And, and she was so, so manipulative. You know, you want to hear something odd about that series? I know this is crazy, and I know it had nothing to do with me, because I, I used to talk about it all the time on the radio show. Eventually, I swear to you, that woman looked like my mother, God rest her soul, and acted like my mother in many ways. You know, she would say things that I heard my mother say. Okay, so there was a commonality. I don't mean they got it from me. But I'm telling you, my mother had been on my show a few times from the old age home in Boca Raton. The famous line when I would call her up and get in a conversation, I said, Mom, to what do you owe your longevity? She was already 86. And I didn't, she wasn't an educated woman. I, so I thought I embarrassed her by saying your longevity. I thought she wouldn't understand me. I was so arrogant. So she, my mother had a sense of timing that was better than mine. So she says to me, in my case, and I say yes, she says no sex. What do you think is the secret to longevity? What, what's the secret? Yeah. No sex. <laughs> <laughs> no sex. Well, that, that in San Francisco is a sin, what you just said, because these people believe that the more is be more sex you have is better. Yeah. Great line, perfect timing. Any great comedian would understand what she had just done there, how good it was. But the point is, my dog's name was Tippy. So now in one of the latest seasons in The Sopranos, when they do a flashback to Tony's child that his dog's name is Tippy. So I say, well, why is it improbable or un impossible to believe that one of the writers listened to you? You were so goddamn popular. You shook the world up with your radio show. They probably heard you. Why not? You were the third most popular show and the only creative one. The others were just headbangers with, with you know, Republican good, Democrat bad. That's all you heard from them. You at least would do art, science, poetry, and get crazy sometimes, play music. So you talk about this. I made to listen to you. They wanted to hear who this guy was. So I talked about Tippy. I had my mother. <laughs> so I like to believe maybe <laughs> a little of me wound up in the Sopranos in a collateral manner. I don't know. Tippy did anyway. It's certainly possible. It's sure, possible. Absolutely. Possible. Yeah. I'm not going to ask the writers. You know, Matthew Weiner was one of the great writers of that series who then went on to do um, uh, Mad Men. Right. Right, Great, yeah. but, you know, Some of the best Sopranos uh, episodes were written by Matthew Weiner. They were incredible. Well, it was a great show for sure. Now, you know, um, you, you just touched on a little bit of your successes and what you've done. So you mentioned about a Michael Savage film in the past, that oh. it was a possibility. You haven't talked about it in a while. Is that something that is not possible anymore? Or what's, what's the news on that? We have some footage that was shot a few years ago by a legitimate Hollywood cinematographer. About 30 minutes of the best footage ever done. Of me sitting, talking straight into the camera about my childhood called Boy in the Basement. And that was going to be the, the centerpiece of this particular movie. I don't really know what happened. I lost interest. I, I really don't remember. Then I have hundreds of hours of, of um, Super 8s and 8s going back to the early years and I've written pieces of it. I've talked to people about it until eventually now we come to this point, this juncture of my life where the world has changed so fast, Frank, and not for the better, where I say, what's the difference if I do this movie? Who the fuck cares? Who's going to pay any attention to it? Why should anyone give a shit what my life was? That's nihilism in a certain way, but it's also realism. Like, who am I competing with? What am I trying to prove? Why do I have to do such a movie? Why do I have to invest any of my brain and life into this anymore? Why? Why would anyone give a shit? That's where my head's at right now. I swear to you. It sounds, doesn't it sound depressing and nihilistic? That's the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, what you just said, I think a lot of people can relate to that feeling with everything, with what's gone over the past few years, this feeling of uh, defeat, the feeling, uh, that feeling. But uh, I think people would want to see it, especially your longtime dedicated followers. You know, uh, it's a, uh, you know, I, not to get political, but I almost feel like it's part of their grand plan to break our spirit, right? Mm. It is to make us not want to create anymore. What's the point of anything anymore? When you say their grand plan, 
that opens <laughs> up a whole series of questions and I'm not going to go there because then you and I'll start talking politics, which I don't think either of us really want to do. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. but their grand plan, I've read that the great replacement theory. I've seen it. It, it does fit. If you really want to make it fit, it fits making the European American disappear from culture, disappear from when I say culture, I mean, music disappear from movies, disappear from literature. When have you last seen an Ernest Hemingway? When have you last seen a Norman Mailer? When have you last seen, oh, let's get more esoteric than that, some of the great writers of the 60s? I mean, they were giants. Everybody read them. Saul Bellow, no one even knows his name anymore. If Saul Bellow existed today, he couldn't get published because the, quote, wokesters who have taken over publishing would not publish a white male writing about his life in that manner. This is how bad things have become. If Shakespeare were alive, he couldn't get a job teaching English uh, at Passaic State University. <laughs> <laughs> or is that to use a college from, from The Sopranos? I saw in one of the episodes the other night where the, the kids are fuck up and he's not studying. And they write a line like the, the kid. Remember what a fuck up the kid was? The son who disappoints Tony tries to commit suicide with, yeah, with Tony the, and, yeah, and he ties the thing on his foot. So jumps in the pool that's a very touching scene when tony jumps in his clothes and he tries to save his son oh my god i cried when i watched that the pathos but she says listen young man if you think you're going to get into east trenton state with those grades you're mistaken <laughs> <laughs> it's funny huh. stuff Everything can relate to the Sopranos one way or another in life, right? It, it, can. Like it. It, it was a seminal piece of work. I, I know people in the film business who agree that it's flawless. And if you watch it, even with the sound off, there's not a scene that was not cut right. The lighting, the sound, right? The, everything was cut directly and uh, perfectly as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Home of Borders, Language, Culture, The Savage Nation. Do we have a little more time? I don't want to go over. Do we have a little more time? Oh, okay. What would the topic be next, Frank? Um, you know, what we didn't really touch on, which I'd like to touch on, is it, which you touched on a little bit, um, maybe inadvertently, you talked about how you had to, um, you know, buy a record or something like that. I want to talk about how we consume our entertainment now. It feels like there's no anticipation anymore. It feels like, you know, everything is just instant, instant gratification. But that could go for any form. So I just want to talk about media, music and movie, where you just get things at the click of a button or you just tell your TV to put it on. And what is that doing to us? Are we really appreciating the art anymore? I feel like it's so disposable mm. now. Because of you mean you don't have to go to a record store save your money go to a record store and buy the record that you love that's like a yeah. whole event it's a part of your life right i'm Absolutely. gonna go buy a Jimi hendrix uh cd or i'm gonna go buy uh you know an album and you take it right. home and you unwrap it you play it it's a it's an event today right. there's no event hit the button you don't like the song cancel it and move on to the next one it's the same yeah. as, same as dating swipe left swipe right drop dead right it's a disposable it's very disposable and what i what i feel and i'm sure you probably agree with me on some points is that it's made us not appreciate things i mean uh you know with people binge uh binging on streaming it, it, you don't even have time to process it anymore it, you watch it and it's on to the next thing on to the next thing mm. and it's just it's a it's a very strange thing and i think it's killing art in a way it's what know? it's what frank what was that word I believe it's killing art in a way. Killing especially art. Artists. I don't even know how a musician can make a living nowadays with the way things are. I mean, Spotify gives them a penny on <laughs> each song played. I mean, it's crazy. They, they, I don't even know how they can survive. That's an interesting uh, thing. You just made me feel better because I'm actually doing very well in my podcast, which I think is owned by Spotify. I'm not <laughs> sure. I think the company that bought the company that bought the company that owns the company that I work with is owned by Spotify. It's all based in Sweden, I think, right? Isn't Spotify yeah. a Swedish company? Go, hey, I love Spotify. Love it. You know, um, <clears throat> before we go, so I made notes of music, rock and roll. And if I were to end this interview, I would end it either with At The Hop 
or something like that or a piece of jazz remember that at the hop the music of course yeah. because i remember going now i'm going back to the 50s again before we go again music which i forgot rock and roll alan freed 1953 54 55 56 that era they had rock and roll shows in black harlem at the apollo theater here i am a white kid going on three subway cars to harlem to go to the apollo theater to hear a rock and roll show and the audience is half black half white nobody got mad at anybody nobody so much as <clears throat> punched anybody let alone shot somebody and everyone was jumping out of their fucking seats and dancing to the fucking music in the Apollo Theater in the 1950s before the fucking civil rights movement destroyed America. A lot, of, a lot has changed since then, you know? Well, I mean, you talk about the great society. What, what's so great about what happened after LBJ? Am I saying I want slavery? That's right. What the left will say. I didn't say that at all. But explain to me how black kids and white kids could be drawn together because that's the, the theme of our discussion by music, by their love for music and have the same experience of that music, lifting them up without any hatred coming out of them. How is that possible? Was it the music themselves itself that projected joy and happiness and happiness and joy rather than hatred? The lyrics certainly didn't project. There was no hatred in the lyrics. Anyone who wrote a hate lyric never would have gotten out of the out of the out of the starting gate. And today, unless you write something hateful, you can't get it published. It has to be all divisive now. Let me start yeah. it on rap music. Please don't. <laughs> I know. Well, you you had a good rap song you did a few you years ago. Fifty fi what? What I what was it? Fifty something? Fifty fifty words of English, right? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, Doug, if you're listening to this, inject fifty words of English because I own that one. I think I wrote the lyrics. I, I couldn't write that. I couldn't do that today. I'll, I'll, oh, here, I know 50 words of English. I know 50 words of English. I know 50 words of English. I got 50 mil in the bank. <clears throat> I, I got 50. I know 50 words of English. You know, that kind of thing. Couldn't do that today. But that probably goes for a, a Kanye Best. Maybe I, I, I saw Kanye Best coming along. <laughs> Yeah, he's all over the place, isn't he? <laughs> how did he suddenly become a black skinhead? I don't know how that happened. Uh, I don't know. That's that's insane, too. I don't know what's going on with that either. Wow. Why did he have to do that to himself? It's, you know, that, it's that's provoking anti-Semitism because yeah, let's say there are Jewish people who own the entertainment industry, many of them. You start saying the Jews control me, the Jews control the entertainment business. That's right out of the Third Reich. That, that's Hitler. Yes. And what it's going to provoke is the stupid people, not as smart as Kanye, Kanye Best. They go out and they shoot Jews or they, they knock them down in the street. They're, you know, that, that language, by the way, I, of his language and his concepts, they're not from him. They're coming out of the nation of Islam from uh, the great leader of the nation of Islam, uh, I forget his name, honestly. I, I don't even carry it around in my mind. But that's their, that's their language. That language is the language of the nation of Islam. Louis Farrakhan hates Jews and talks about the Jews as the devil and then says uh, that the black people are Jews as well. Again, to co-opt an entire religion and a people. You talk about co-opting someone's culture. We keep hearing from the left, don't co-opt my culture. <clears throat> that's stealing my culture. How about saying you're not even a Jew, but I am? Could you imagine how bad this has become? This maybe doesn't belong in your magazine. You have to cut this stuff out. That's right. I won't include this. I, yeah. <laughs> no, you can include it. I'm going to keep it in my podcast. But okay. Yeah, no, but uh, I, I know what you're saying. You know, I wanted to tell you one other thing, you know, which I'm not going to include in my interview. You're welcome to include it in yours if you'd like, is that, um, you know, we didn't really touch on politics, which I wanted to stay away from. Yeah. You did as well. But um I wanted to tell you that there's actually some artists out there, rock artists, who you'd be surprised that are artistically speaking up about the current culture we're living in. And, you know, they're talking, uh, one band comes to mind named Shinedown, a rock band. They have an album called Planet Zero. Well, you could think about what Planet Zero is, you know. Planet Zero, about. that's like my book, Government Zero. Right. He's so they, very, they, very, they, he's very, well, they're, they're into it. They know what that means. Planet Zero right. is a Marxist statement. Right. And there's another uh, another newer rock band called Nothing More. 
where they uh, they talk about these things as well. And, uh, you know, there's a this really popular band called Muse, which have a song out called Compliance. Mm. And this is in the mainstream. So these it's it's almost like a sign of hope. Do you that think somebody, that there's an undercurrent developing <laughs> that is reacting to the overbearing so. oppression of the of I have to say it like it is of the communist left that is controlling everything we hear? I, I believe there is an undercurrent, and that gives um, you a little bit of hope. When I, when I see this, when other people see this, they're saying, wow, these artists are in the mainstream, and they're saying this. I don't even know how they're getting away with saying the things they're saying in some of these songs. There's one artist. He's a, he's a hip-hop artist, but before you said that, he's a hip-hop artist. He's an independent hip-hop artist. His name is Tom McDonald, and this guy um, has millions of views, and every one of his songs touch on everything going on and he goes right at it he doesn't mince words hmm. and uh he's and he he's independent no record label will touch him because of the things he talks about but he's very smart i could tell you that and i think well, uh, what's the listen, name of the group this guy's name is tom mcdonald he's a hip-hop hip -hop artist he just released a new song called Wait, she tom mcdonald hip-hop artist yes african-american or white guy he's a white guy he's okay a white guy. i'm just curious where this is coming yeah. from and he has he just released a new song called the other day called sheeple anyway he gets sheeple sheeple so he must have listened to my show come on he must have grown up on it you should get him on your yeah, show if he did a song called sheeple that's my word but you know frank before you go we've had a wonderful discussion from my point of view i hope you've enjoyed it as well about art yes at the end of the day it's about art and about the oppression of art by a government and who controls a publishing company, a record label, a, a movie making. I remember reading that the artist is supposed to be a revolutionary. A good artist is a revolutionary. That's number one. So right now we're seeing revolutionaries who are standing up to this society right now, which is oppressively coming from the left side. That's the whole ethos of the left. It runs everything. But they also, another one wrote that the real artist is basically... Uh, a criminal that there's a very slight very slim difference between a really phenomenal artist and a criminal and i remember reading that in the era that i was reading about particularly the french anarchists the french poets they understood how how the great artist really was so almost anti-society is what they were certainly anti-rigidity, anti-society, want to put it that way. But they said that the artist was a revolutionary. That I think we've all heard. And uh, I don't think they meant a communist when they said that necessarily. They meant that against the, the mores or the norms. And right now the mores and the norms are so twisted that you'd have to be leave it to beaver to be a revolutionary. In other words, the revolutionary today would, would be imposing Norman Rockwell's view of America rather than, <clears throat> you know, the other side. But very interestingly, the artist as a criminal has always interested me. And when I've gotten very extreme in my, in my art as a word musician, I've realized that you have to be almost like a criminal to really be good at it. You have to almost become a criminal to fire those words off in the right manner. You have to be a criminal to do it right. Literally, each, each word has to be a bullet. Right, right. Well, well, you know, uh, true art takes risks, and true art doesn't uh, tow any lines. Right? It's about uh, it's about uh, challenging things and being daring. No, you can't get away with it today and get published. That's for sure. <laughs> so we'll yeah. pause on this note. I will show you what, an image to close it. Can you see this, Frank? I can. I keep this on my desk during my broadcasts only because I like the shape of it. <laughs> Maybe it reminds me to remember that I've got to use words like bullets for them to fly. How does a how do you think about the power of words, Frank? I sit here alone in a fucking room with a microphone, and I use my head, project it out, record it, send it out there. How does it get anywhere? How does it reach people with this zillions of megabytes of shit flying around that they can listen to at any second? How do you break through that, right? Think about that, how incredible it is. 
that I left radio after 26 years. It was my sixth or fifth career. I went into it at age 52, left radio, went into podcasting, and now my podcast is in the top 0.3% of all podcasts, according to my ad agency. How do I do it? Where do I get the drive to do it? Why do I do it? Why do I continue to do it? That's a topic for the next time we get together, because it may be my swan song where I say, guess what, Frank, I'm retiring. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope not. We still need you. Hey, is Bob Dylan still performing, by the way? I believe he is. I think he uh, he w- he just played some shows late last year. So, I guess I believe he is. How the hell does he do it? I, I don't understand. He's in his 80s. He's my age. The Rolling Stones are still performing. Oh, and they're, they're, they're also, that's a whole separate story, but all the Alta Paul McCartney Cockers, still performing. All the Alta Cockers, as we used to say in New York, are still performing. They all look like Bernie Sanders now with a guitar to me. <laughs> when I see Bob Dylan, I, as much as I loved him, he looks like Bernie Sanders' sister. <laughs> all right, we had a good laugh. I got my shots in. Um, I'm going to um, say we'll do it again whenever we'll t- communicate. Yeah. And um, when might we see your little write-up, your big write-up? There's a lot of words here. There's a lot. So it's probably going to take me a few weeks to, you know, to get to transcribe it. And I'll uh, I'll send the transcript over to you guys and just so, you know, you could look it no, over. No, we won't edit it. anything. I'm not going to do that. You do it. Whatever you okay. want. But again, who am I speaking with? Again, tell the audience and how they could follow you. So, um... The website is crypticrock.com, and you just go right to the website. Um, honestly, I'm not too big on the social media stuff. We do have them, but I don't use them that much. Wow. But, I try to um, but yeah, it's crypticrock.com. And that's how you can find us. And we have a very diverse mix of uh, music and film and other types of entertainment, news, reviews, and interviews. As you say, news, reviews. I, I used to call myself news, views, and reviews. But Frank Malerba, you're the owner of Cryptic Rock. Yes, I am. I'm the one that started it, and I uh, have kept it going now for almost 10 years. Congratulations. You're doing a great service to humanity, and I'm not just being an asshole saying it just to sound like I'm smart. You are. It's a very tough thing what you're doing. And you have a reason for doing it, and I, I sensed it in discussing this with you today, What where you're coming from. So thank you for the time as well. Thank you, Dr. Chavis. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to speaking to you soon. No, I'm looking at your background with that screen behind you. Yes. I keep saying to myself, he's actually in a, an interrogation room somewhere. <laughs> and no, I'm in my office in my house. No, no, it actually, looks like they pulled the screen so I can't see the cops behind the window there who, who <laughs> let you have fun today, but they're putting you back into the padded cell right after this is over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Frank, have a, a great night. You really made my day. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Beth Savage. Speak to you soon. Okay, bye now. <laughs> bye. Michael Savage, a host like no other. As we mentioned before in this interview, I spoke with Cryptic Rock eight years ago. I want to replay that original interview for you at this time. Now, my first question for you now, obviously, you know, you've achieved a long list of accomplishments in your life. A PhD in epidemiology, a nutritional scientist, sciences, and you've authored countless books, and you host the Savage Nation. Um, what I want to know is, uh, you adopted a show called Rock and Roll Fridays. Where did the idea come from? It came from rock and roll itself. I mean, I love rock and roll. I have since I've been a boy. And who who didn't? Who didn't love the music of the 50s and 60s? And so, on my Friday shows, I play old rock and roll, mainly 50s and 60s as part of Rock and Roll Friday. And everyone loves it because I open Monday with Blue Monday by Fats Domino. And Friday, they look forward to the Rock and Roll Friday, as I say. It's just a part of his past and its glorious past. It's also part of my past. And uh, I think it makes for a very interesting uh, entertainment. I agree with you. I think it's a great thing to interject into the show and adds much diversity. Now, um, you growing up in the 1950s and 60s, you had the opportunity to experience a golden age of rock and roll. I myself, I grew up listening to the 50s and 60s rock and roll, thank- thankfully to my father's tastes. And um, I have to say, every time I hear the music, I get an overwhelming feeling of a happier and more simple time. What was it like growing up experiencing this music as it happened? 
You know, it's easy to think that the past was always better, but in fact, it wasn't a happier and an easier time because we lived under the cloud of a nuclear uh, holocaust. Remember, you know, when I went to grade school in the 50s, we had to jump underneath desks for air raid drills in New York City public schools. Duck and cover occurred very frequently. We were all expecting a, an imminent nuclear war to break out between Russia and the U.S. So we lived in this constant fear of, of this existential existence, of the existence being annihilated. Uh, and she say, well, it was easy. Well, you were younger, so if you were younger, things seemed, you know, more carefree, right? Right. I, I would say that any young kid today if he has parents who love him and aren't drug addicts and they don't put him on, on, on some mind-bending drug, you know, Adderall or some other mind-bending, uh, soul-killing medication that some crackpot with a stethoscope prescribes because the kid's too bright or too fidgety to sit in the classroom, I think that kid enjoys himself. I see kids running around the neighborhood on skateboards, jumping around, enjoying themselves. Kids are still kids. So to them, it's still, you know, forever childhood. Childhood is childhood, I think, Frank. You've got kids in Africa playing in mud puddles who are enjoying themselves. You know what I'm saying? Children have the magical capacity, if they're not starving or being threatened with something, to enjoy themselves. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's just something very endearing about the music of the 50s and 60s. You know, and many of these songs are still heard in popular culture today, whether it be in films or television or wherever it may be. Uh, tell me, why do you think so many of these tracks have such extreme relevance in modern culture? Well, it's interesting. The Sopranos, for example, one of my favorite shows of all time, which I love to watch reruns of, uh, <clears throat> continuously plays stuff in the 50s and 60s as a background, you know, the doo-wop era, for example. Uh, why does it have relevance? Because you think of the, not only the music, Frank, but the lyrics were about love, idealizing woman, boy and girl. You know, how much better does it get? There was no ambivalence. There was no propaganda in the music. It was real. It was about basics. Now every song has to go through the filter of will it be, will it be bought and will it be played by those psychopaths who control everything. Yeah, that's true. It's very true. It's uh, It came from a more, um, I guess, close to home place from the heart. And it was, uh, it was beautiful oh, that it's way. More about, no, it's about the universals that the world still knows to be true. Boy loves girl. Girl is goddess. Girl is on a pedestal. Boy wants girl. Or they break up. Girl pines for boy. How much more basic does it get? It goes on around the world, despite what the psychos tell us. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, now with that said, you're a man of wide range of tastes in every different every different thing from listening to Savage Nation. Um, you know, today's music is a lot different. And uh, I noticed that you like to you play um, a lot of heavy metal music in between uh, when you go um, between commercials and such like Ramstein and Metallica and some Miley Crew stuff. Tell me what turned you on to the metal music um, to put it in interjected into your show. Well, I had a teenage son 20 years ago who's now a grown man. And I remember when I, <laughs> I, remember when I found Metallica music in his, in his drawer. I said, what are you, how dare you, <laughs> how dare you play this garbage in my house? <laughs> It'll turn you into a drug addict. So I, as he moved out, I went through his stuff and I found it and played it. I actually loved it. So he laughs to this day. You know, I got it from my, my son in many ways because he grew up through that period. It's really it's funny. Incredible music. It is incredible music. And, you know, as you say, uh, it was more simple back then, boy, you know, boy and girl. Now, this music is more reflective of the times we're in now. Do you agree with that? What, the, the heavy metal? Yes. Well, yes, the disparate tones, the disparate currents, the, uh, the, the shock and awe of the music to take the, the narcotized pedestrian and electrify him or her. Yeah, I mean, we're like sleepwalkers needing to be awakened. And that music seems to, to touch that chord. But I gotta tell you, Frank, what I listen to in my home before I go on the air, like for an hour before if I'm doing a show from home, is the Blue Note Collector's Edition. I don't think you cover jazz, but you know, you're a rock and roll guy, right? Yeah, I, I love all types of rock and roll, yes. Yeah, but you, you think of the, of the Blue Note Collector's Edition of the Greats in jazz. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but there's something to be said about that as well. 
Thelonious Monk, whoever they may be, uh, Kenny Burrell and the obvious Cannibal Adelaide. I mean, I can name all of them, but the point I'm making is that uh, jazz is certainly not popular anymore. I don't think it is. I don't think it reaches the people. It's from a different time. But, you know, Frank, a lot of this has to do with what drugs were being used by musicians in their time. I think that reflects in the music, don't you? I agree with you. Yeah, it does reflect. I mean, you look at um, the late '60s with the, you know, with the the peace movement and everything. That definitely, I agree with you, reflects. Yeah, I mean, but the jazz artists were largely on heroin, and the music reflects a different tempo, a different somberness. It's much slower in some ways. Yes. But the heavy metal would reflect not marijuana, but let's say cocaine or one of the speed-like drugs, maybe amphetamine, right? Or amphetamine-like compounds, I would think. I don't know what the heck they were on, but it certainly wasn't something that slowed them down. You know, it's very interesting you should say that. I've never thought of it that way until you mentioned that. But yeah, it does seem like someone would have to be on a speed drug to be playing thing this aggressive and this fast, you know? So, I think so. And the, and the music acts like drugs on our, on our brain. So that's why it's so popular. I mean, we need to keep going in this society that, you know, we have to push ourselves and to survive. And uh, so the music, in, 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 a, in a way, is a surrogate drug. It's very interesting. I never thought of it that way. You now, you, your, your publication, is this a written publication or what is it? It's a written publication. I'm the, the, I'm the main writer on the site and I'm also the editor on the site. So I do all the articles myself. Interesting, fascinating. Yes, and is there I, any that touches your interest with me? Uh, what touches my interest with you? Well, I'm an avid listener of the Savage Nation. I have been for years. I listened with my father. Um, my, oh. fa my father has passed on now, but uh, I've been Sorry a listener. Sorry to hear that. Where do you live, Frank? I live in Long Island in New York, and uh, I grew up here. And, uh, you know, it's funny because my dad and I always used to listen to the show loved it he turned me on to you at a young age and i still continue to listen to you and uh i'm sure you heard this before now that my father's gone i listen to you i listen to you like a father figure because you're the only voice of clarity that i hear out of all the nonsense that you hear on television and radio well i'm awed by that that i've achieved that that, that place in your life i don't think you're alone though frank i you know i've been on the radio 20 years this march and often, it's often it catches me off base when I meet people who say, I started listening to you when I was five in my father's car, and he's gone, you know. It's touching, it really is, when you think about it. Yeah, well, it, it just, um, you know, it's a testament to the wonderful job you've done over the years, because I used to, used to listen to a various uh, array of talk shows, but you're the only one I listen to now, because I like to hear what everyone else had to say, but you're the only one I listen to now, because you're the only one that really gives it straight as it is, and I love that you don't tow uh, party lines when it comes to politics, you just say it like it is, and it's independent, conservative thoughts, which I love. I could call myself an independent conservative. I, I tell you, another definition might be a sane American perspective. Because when you think about it, it crosses all party lines in all directions. I don't think you can typecast where I'm going to go on, on any topic. Maybe you can on some, but not on all. Especially since you're coming at me from the music point. Who would expect Mr. Conservative to be playing rock and roll, jazz, heavy metal, uh, you know, you name it. You wouldn't expect that. Why? Because I'm a man of many tastes. You imagine in the old days they'd call a person like me a renaissance man. Nobody even knows what that means anymore. They would say he's crazy because he doesn't have any strict uh, guidelines to what you can expect from him. Yeah, but that's a full person. Why should you be able to predict what a person likes or what a person is, right? I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm very similar to you. I mean, I, I don't really, you can't predict me in many ways. I, I like many different things, I'm, you know, and uh, I agree with you totally. Well, be careful. Don't let the NSA hear that you like many different things. You may not fit into the new America, Frank. <laughs> I don't think I do fit into the new America. But, um, yeah, I really appreciate you talking to me, Dr. Savage. Um, I know they told me that we had a cutoff of 10 minutes, so I don't want to keep you any longer than you have to. Well, let's do this another time. It's always great. We'll talk about rock and roll, heavy metal, music, the Savage Nation, anytime you want. I would love Pretty to. Much. Frank, what's the name of your publication? It's called uh, crypticrock.com. Well, it's interesting to me that a man of my generation could be touching someone of your generation, especially with a website such as yours, 
that obviously aimed at what kids and people in their twenties. Would you say? Um, well, what's interesting about my site? See, like what well, you said that you're unpredictable. I'm unpredictable as well because yes, it's mostly hard rock and stuff. But I also do pieces. Like I did a piece on uh, the Everly Brother who just passed away. I try to diversify and interject that older rock and roll into it. Interesting, Frank. I appreciate it, and um, again, my you know my my condolences for your having lost your father and. I hope in some small way I can fill that role. You do very much. And my, my life is great. We, I have a baby daughter now. She's three months old. I've been married for almost three years. So life is good. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks for spending some time with me, Frank. And good luck. Thank you, Dr. Savage. I'll talk to you soon. Bye now. Bye. Well, thank you very much for listening to today's podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it and you'll learn something from it. We have about 400 other episodes available for you to listen to absolutely free. You can go back into our vast library of podcasts and listen to any one of them at any time. And remember this, if you want to listen to my podcast ad-free, sign up for the Savage Premium Membership and get access to ad-free podcasts as well as some premium content from our Savage Archives. How do you sign up for those ad-free podcasts? please visit michaelsavage.com for a link. Again, thank you for your listenership. This is Michael Savage. The Air Traffic Out of Control podcast has landed. Each week you can hear crazy, funny, and downright nerve-wracking audio from airport control towers around the globe. Well, we're outside here. They're saying the ramp is closed. They won't let us park because of uh, Air Force One. It's tower 192. There apparently is a passenger opened up an overwing exit and is now on the wing attempting to jump. Can you alert uh, police, please? Real audio from pilots and air traffic controllers. You absolutely need to maintain radio silence if it's not ATC related. You're in obstruction to air traffic control. Otherwise, we can file some paperwork. Air Traffic Out of Control is now available wherever you get your podcasts. Don't miss it.